funding measure, either in 2022 or 2024. I, we had our first meeting last time, and I think people started getting excited about the potential for 2022. So that was great. Um, I, uh, my name is Margaret Brodkin, and I founded Funding the Next Generation because I really want our people to learn to use the ballot and to learn to use the ballot to get more money for our children and our youth because that is one of the biggest barriers to making changes in the lives of young people. So, and we need to get better at getting money and use the ballot to do that. So welcome everyone. Um, I. I will do an introduction, and then after that, I will introduce James Harrison, our guest, and he brought a fellow attorney with him. But in case you're wondering, I put James' bio in the, in the chat, and people feel free to use the chat. But let me just quickly start going through the people on my screen, <laughs> just to say who you are, where you're from, is there any particular thing you wanna make sure you get, or is there any progress you wanna report all in one sentence, or any <laughs> tear your hair out barrier that you just want people to be aware of as we make this journey together through this very challenging but rewarding work. So, um, Michelle, you can introduce yourself uh, first and then tell us the progress in a sentence and then we'll go on to a newcomer to this, Israel. Sure, thank you so much. And I'm sorry in advance for the noise. We have a Easter egg hunt here at work. So everybody's like running around trying to find the Easter eggs. But hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michelle, pronounce she, her, hers. And I am with the Invest in Youth Campaign. And we just had a really huge win um, on April 1st. So our goal has been to be able to create LA City's first ever youth development department. And we finally did that. So on <laughs> April 1st, we got um, Eric Garcetti to give us $1.1 million to be able to start our youth development department. So it's just the beginning because we still have to do implementation and all that stuff, but it's a huge win for us. So it, it, it's a huge win for our field, for everything. And this will be a kickoff point to getting a dedicated fund for youth. And we can discuss James later, sort of, do you put a department in a fund? Do you get the fund first? Do you? <laughs> so thank you, Anna. I think this is the most exciting news the, to report. Israel? Sure. Uh, good afternoon. Muy buenas tardes. My name is Israel Villa. He, him, his. I myself am uh, very proud to be from Salinas, East Salinas. And uh, I'm also, my job is uh, currently have the honor and pleasure of serving as a deputy director for the California Alliance for Youth and Community Justice, which is basically uh, all of our advocates, attorneys, California, we've got quite a team and uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to meet everybody and uh, interested in these conversations, both with our state partners, but also very much here in Salinas. I think there's a appetite and a, and a big opportunity. So I'm excited. I didn't, I didn't know there was a possibility of local ballots. Okay, Aaron. Hanukkah, you say your name correctly. Hoga boom, but it's okay. I was, and I'm just so excited. I'm from Salinas originally. So Israel, it's so nice to see you on here. I'm in San Diego now, but yay, <laughs> yay Salinas. Um, hi everyone, Erin Hoga boom. Uh, I'm with uh, San Diego for Every Child. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, Aya, and um, Oh, well, we can't, I don't want to focus on the negative, but we did, um, we did, we have some, we have an uphill battle because we just got our mayor's uh, budget out. And unfortunately, the ask that was widely supported by our city council for an office of child and youth success was not listed in the mayor's budget. Um, so it, uh, we're not, we're not discouraged. We will, we will keep on um, a lot of the council members. Ultimately, it will be decided um, in council. And so uh, we have a lot of support there. And I think um, there's definitely still a pathway there. There was um, quite a bit of funding for, for youth initiatives 
initiative. So, um, so that is a good thing. And, and we just have to kind of pivot and um, redirect, uh, you know, in terms of, of just really encouraging our mayor to think about things long term. So You'll that's, do it. that's our sharing. Yes, we will. <laughs> hey, Zeus. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jesus Sanchez. He, him, his. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Gente Organizada. We do intergenerational community organizing in Pomona, California. And we've been uh, doing our own kind of uh, local funding the next generation campaign for probably four years. Um, we started with reinstating our youth commission and uh, just really focusing on increasing funding. And we are uh, anticipating uh, launching our first ballot initiative in 2022. And um, yeah, we're, we're super, super curious to get some like crucial questions answered. And um, in terms of where we're at, we're doing our advocacy as usual around the budget, um, but internally our young people are making the rounds within our own, own network, our own community to get not only the blessing, but the, the support of different key leaders within our community to get behind this. So um, still in concept phase, but I'm hoping that today is gonna help clarify a lot of our, uh, the vision we have for, for what we wanna do. So thank you right. folks and looking forward to it. Great, Nicole. Sorry, mute button. Um, hey everyone, Nicole Dursey, um, uh, principal co-founder 50 plus one strategies uh joy to work with margaret and all of you and just here to provide some um political insight and thrill james is with us today so nicole is our political consultant james is our lawyer <laughs> jim Keddy. yeah hi everybody i'm jim Keddy with youth forward and set kids first and i think as many, some of you know we did a children's ballot measure in 2020 and had sort of our local political establishment come out against it quite strongly and we lost. Since then, we've been meeting on a regular basis with uh, the mayor of Sacramento and presented to city council a few days ago, had a lot of support from city council. We had the mayor say uh, several times during the meeting that he was working with us on a ballot measure for 2022. So, uh, so we have some momentum and uh, hopefully we're going to come up with a different way to, to uh, a different equation to, to win next time. So. Thank you. Marcos. Thank you, Margaret. I have to unmute there. Hello, everybody. Marcos Osorio uh, with the Central Valley uh, Community Foundation. We're best, uh, based in, Cal in Fresno, California. Uh, I'm the programs officer there for the human capital bucket of our collective impact process that we call DRIVE. One of the projects in there is our preconception of five uh, and more recently, now we, we have some some youth engagement uh, uh, organizations that, that that we've outreached to. So we're, we're like last time I was super long winded. I'll leave it there. We're also we're in the very organizing stage of this. So I'm just really here to listen and, and continue to learn for some some potential ideas. Okay, um, I'm just going in the order on my screen. Otherwise, I will leave people out. But Derek. Hi, Derek Lee. I'm the Director of Research and Compliance with 50 Plus One Strategies. So I work with Nicole and I'm just here to be updated on uh, from the best in the industry. Great. Courtney. Hi, all. Uh, Courtney Baltiski, she, her, hers, uh, paid by the Y in San Diego, but happy to, to co convene our local early care and education advocacy coalition. Um, we have some ex exciting things happening um, on a county level with 10 million now earmarked in ARPA funding for child care. Um, we just completed an extensive survey of close to 500 child care providers. Um, so we crafted a, a draft of an $85 million uh, funding recommendation for the county and, and we'll be uh, continuing to work with the supervisors as well as other smaller municipalities to all be a part of the solution um, in how childcare finds resilience uh, coming out of the pandemic. Um, okay. But we've got a, a number of San Diego peeps here. So thank you, thank you. Uh, Laura. Speaking of, I'm Laura Cohn, she, her, hers, um, currently with Mission Driven Finance and UCSD. Um, longtime agitator and advocate for children's measures because I ran one in Seattle a couple decades ago and would love to see one here in San Diego and more of them around California. Thanks. Okay, yes. Diana. 
Hi, I'm Diana Ross from Mid City Can in San Diego. As you can see, we have a big presence here today. Um, I don't have much to add to what uh, my colleagues have been saying, except we just have to continue pushing. Yes, September. Yeah, I'm learning, everybody. Hi, I'm September. I'm Hyzing Simons. Uh, we fund in. We're interested um, on both our foundation and action fund in closing the financing gap, particularly for early childhood and effective forms of governance because young kids don't vote. So I do want to ask people to be brief because I we want to get to our legal questions. So, okay. I noticed she said that right before I spoke, but I'm Kay Rustaller, Executive Director for Family Resource and Referral Center and also co-founder of the San Joaquin Children's Alliance. And um, we are in the process of regrouping. We've had two ballot initiatives around cannabis and a dedicated fund for children. Uh, the last one in 2020, we lost by less, it's like 1.9 percentage points. So we are regrouping third time is a charm. So here we come <laughs> and just looking for, uh, just curious about the two thirds, you know, special tax and if there's anything from James perspective legally as an update on that front. Just know they're in a general law county. Uh, Leanne, in your garden. Hi everyone, Leanne Chen with My Girls in Action here in Long Beach, California. So great to be here with everyone today. Congratulations to LA um, Invest in Youth Campaign there. Um, I'm also here representing the Long Beach Invest in Youth Campaign, um, and I look forward to hearing um, updates from everybody and getting some legal updates from James as well. Thank you, Susan Gomez. You're, you're muted. I am muted, I apologize. Um, so I'm Susan Gomez, good afternoon. I go by she, her, Aya. Um, we are out here in the Inland Empire, the San Bernardino Riverside County. I'm a collaborative group of about 90 nonprofits. We are working on a two county children's cabinet that is actually moving with the help of uh, Margaret and her team have been instrumental in getting us going. And we actually have an ask of $5 million right now from both counties around children's, um, you know, the next round of COVID dollars. So we're excited about presenting that to the counties by next week. Okay, Chia. Sorry. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Chia. I am the managing director for eBayC. Uh, we're a youth organization that works with API youth, particularly Southeast Asian youth. Uh, we're a member of SAC Kids First. So glad to be in this space and looking forward to learn. Fabulous. Everybody's switching around on my screen. Martine. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm driving. Um, my name is Martine Watkins, and I'm with uh, Santa Cruz. I'm on the Santa Cruz City Council and um, also work in education and just really interested in continuing to have more investment in youth um, through policy and uh, looking at possibly a ballot measure as well. Thanks, Margaret. Okay, uh, Jay Franco. Hey, folks, Jay Franco, uh, part of SAC Kids First. Uh, echo everything that Jim said about our... Uh, update, you know, after redefining public safety uh, in our city definition, we just, you know, kept on it, uh, you know, to include prevention services and youth programs and uh, yeah, just had a really good meeting and the, the ball's uh, moving. So, yeah. Uh, Nina, did you go? No. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry, my internet's been spotty, so I'm on the phone. Um, I'm Mina Alcaraz from First Five Monterey County, located in Salinas, and it's really great to see so many familiar faces um, on the Zoom. So, last but not least, Francine. Hi, Francine Rod, also with First Five Monterey County, and we are working with our Children's Council to put forward an ask uh, related to the American um, uh, rescue dollars, uh, as well as ongoing funding for bright beginnings and support and services in our, in our county for children and their families. Fabulous. So I don't think, did I leave anybody out? So this is a fabulous group. So I'm going to turn the meeting over to James Harrison, who is um, uh, with 
a, 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 well, I would say a newly merged law firm, but it isn't that new. Basically, the two best law firms in the state that work on ballot measures and election law merged, and they were lucky to get to have James be part of the merger, who uh, is one of the leading experts. I love what you write in your bio um, of both drafting and defending ballot measures because they need as much defense as they need drafting. Um, so we are honored today to have him with us. Um, and he brought one of his colleagues whose name is not popping out at me here and maybe Ben Ben, ben Gaverser Mark uh, has, so maybe you uh, can has introduce me today. your colleague oh yes and and then we asked him to start by giving us the latest on something we've all been following forever <laughs> which is okay can we pass ballot measures with a 50% vote um, if you collect signatures. So you can give us a little background on that and then where you think it's at. And then people can ask you hard questions like, should we do it or shouldn't we? <laughs> that, that, that sounds great. And, and actually I brought Ben along to answer the hard questions. So uh, pose them to him. But uh, uh, I'm really happy to be with you all uh, this afternoon. So for, for my part, my first involvement uh, with the children's measure was, was actually uh, in drafting Prop 10 uh, back in 1997. Uh, and since then, I've been involved in a variety of, of different efforts uh, and uh, uh, just uh, believe it's a really important issue. So I'm happy to uh, be here with you this afternoon to talk through the, the state of the law and then also to answer questions you might have. So I, I understand there probably is a, a spectrum of, of how closely all of you have been following uh, changes in California law. So I'm gonna try to summarize it fairly quickly, but you know, please feel free to ask me questions. So back in, in 2017, long before COVID, uh, I think uh, the general understanding of, of lawyers, courts, uh, uh, and interest groups uh, was that uh, the combination of Prop uh, 13 and Prop 218 meant that uh, uh, special taxes, that is uh, taxes that were placed on the ballot for uh, a specified purpose like early care and education required a two thirds vote, regardless of whether they were placed on the ballot by a legislative body like the city council or board of supervisors uh, or by the voters through the qualification of a ballot measure. Uh, and uh, then along came uh, the California Supreme Court uh, with a uh, a decision in a case called uh, California Cannabis Coalition versus uh, City of Upland in, in 2017 that appeared to suggest a, uh, a radically different understanding of those constitutional provisions. So the I issue in that case wasn't actually the vote threshold uh, for adopting taxes, but uh, was instead a, a more arcane question relating to uh, another provision in Prop uh, 218 that specified that uh, when a, uh, a general tax is placed on the ballot uh, by a municipality, uh, it has to appear on a general election ballot. Uh, that case involved a voter qualified measure and the court concluded that the requirement uh, that a general tax be placed on a general election ballot only applied when the legislative body itself placed the measure on the ballot not when the voters qualify to measure. Uh, the, the language uh, of, the, of the opinion relied largely on uh, language that's very similar to the language regarding the vote threshold. Uh, so when the constitution uh, speaks about the vote threshold for a special tax measure, it refers to the legislative body imposing, extending, or increasing the tax. So that uh, signaled uh, a possible window uh, for voter qualified special taxes. And I think a lot of us read the opinion to suggest that al although the question wasn't before the California Supreme Court at, at the time, that if they were asked, they would answer the question uh, in the affirmative, that voter qualified special taxes are subject to different rules. Uh, they require only a majority to pass and, and that the two thirds vote requirement only applies when the city council or board of supervisors places the special tax measure on the ballot. So that led no, to- Can you say, James, what a sure. voter qualified measure is? Yeah, I'm sorry. So a voter qualified measure uh, refers to a measure that uh, uh, 
citizens circulate among themselves. So uh, under California law, uh, uh, voters have uh, the power of initiative, which means we have the right to uh, circulate proposed laws uh, and collect signatures from fellow voters in order to qualify measures uh, for the ballot. And there are very uh, uh, detailed rules governing that process. Uh, but what it means is that the voters can take uh, the law into their own hands in a sense. Uh, and if they're unable to convince uh, the city council or the board of supervisors to take some action, uh, they can use the power of initiative to, to force the council or the supervisor's hands. So when I say a voter qualified initiative, I mean one that's been circulated among the voters for, for signature uh, and that qualifies uh, by gathering a sufficient number of signatures. So after this case came down in 2017, uh, actually the city and county of San Francisco uh, really took the lead because the city attorney uh, issued an opinion in which he concluded that what the California Supreme Court's decision meant was that voter qualified special taxes required only a majority vote. So uh, San Francisco at, at the time uh, had uh, two special tax measures uh, on the ballot and then uh, another one in November. Uh, and uh, when he uh, described those measures in the voter pamphlet, he specified that they required only a majority vote. Uh, so all three of the measures in San Francisco uh, actually uh, passed uh, with more than 50% plus one, but less than two thirds. So not surprisingly, uh, lawsuits were filed challenging uh, each of them. Uh, at the same time, uh, the city of Fresno uh, similarly considered a, a, a voter qualified special tax. Uh, and that also uh, was approved by more than a majority of the voters, but less than, uh, less than two thirds. And the same was true in the city of Oakland uh, with measure AA. Uh, so what has uh, flowed from that is a series of, of, uh, of litigation. And we are now at the point where uh, three different appellate courts have ruled on the question of whether voter qualified special taxes require a majority vote and a two or a two thirds vote. And all three of those courts have read the California Supreme Court's decision the same way uh, to mean that voter qualified special taxes only require a majority vote. In two of those cases, one involving um, a 2018 San Francisco measure Prop C, which imposed a gross receipts tax to fund uh, homeless services, and the city of uh, Fresno measure, uh, which I referenced, which was a sales tax measure to fund uh, parks and after school programs. Um, in both of those cases, uh, petitions for review were filed in the California Supreme Court, and the California Supreme Court declined to hear those cases meaning those decisions are now final and the jurisdictions can not only collect, but can spend the taxes on the, on the specified purposes. Uh, the third decision uh, also involving yet another San Francisco uh, Prop C um, uh, is, uh, 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 I'm sorry, in, in, in that case, the Court of Appeal held as the other two did uh, that uh, voter qualified special taxes only required a majority vote. Uh, and this one, by the way, uh, was a tax on commercial run, rents to fund uh, early care and education programs. Uh, so it reached the same conclusion as, uh, as in the other two cases, but importantly, it reached another issue, uh, which is whether the involvement of uh, local elected officials changes the analysis. Um, one of the supervisors was a proponent of, of that Prop C and the challengers argued that that effectively made it like a legislative measure and that it should be subject to two thirds vote, even if the others were a majority, the court flat out rejected that argument, uh, which is important because it's been raised in a couple of other cases. The petition for review before the California Supreme Court is still pending in that case. Uh, we expect that the court will issue a decision about whether or not to take the case in the next few weeks. Uh, our expectation is that the court is unlikely to hear uh, that case because the analysis largely follows the two earlier appellate court decisions. And what that suggests to us is that this is beginning to look a lot like a settled question of law. Um, I had actually expected uh, that if the California Supreme Court was gonna uh, reach out and take one of these cases, that it would take the first opportunity it had to do so. 
uh, but it not only declined that opportunity, it declined the next one as well. Uh, so that's a very, very good sign uh, for, uh, for groups like yours who want to try to use the initiative process to fund uh, children, uh, children's programs. I, I will say that uh, <clears throat> there's still some uncertainty for, for two reasons. Oh, One, don't say that. I'm sorry, Margaret. <laughs> I'm the lawyer. I have to, I have to give you the, the good news and the bad news. So uh, the uncertainty arises from really two, two factors. One is that there are other cases pending. So uh, measure AA, uh, which was an Oakland personal tax measure adopted in, uh, in 2018 to fund uh, early care and cradle to career programs has been fully briefed and is pending in the Court of Appeal, uh, waiting oral argument. Uh, likewise, uh, San Francisco uh, uh, Prop G, which was a parcel tax to fund SFUSD, uh, is also pending in the First District Court of Appeal. Uh, it's also been fully briefed and awaiting review. It's possible that the, uh, the different divisions of the appellate court uh, that are hearing those cases could reach a different decision uh, than the one uh, that has been reached by the three other courts, which would mean that we would have a conflict among the appellate courts, and that would uh, make it highly likely that the California Supreme Court uh, would step in and, uh, and resolve the issue. Hopefully that won't be the case. Hopefully we'll be five, in, uh, five for five uh, by the end of this year, um, since I expect those decisions will probably be uh, issued sometime uh, later this year. Uh, and, and there is uh, yet another case pending uh, Alameda County Measure C, which was adopted in March 2020, a sales tax measure to fund early care uh, and education and pediatric care. A challenge to that measure is pending in Alameda County Superior Court. So that likely won't be resolved until uh, sometime in 2022. Uh, so it's possible that one of the appellate courts could reach a different decision, and that would mean that the California Supreme Court would step in and and resolve the issue. Uh, so that's one element of uncertainty. The other is that it is always possible, as in, in 2018, that uh, various industry uh, groups uh, might align to propose a ballot measure uh, to amend the state constitution to expressly require a two-thirds vote for special taxes. <clears throat> so in, in 2018, the soda industry uh, backed uh, such a measure uh, qualified for the ballot, but uh, as a result of a legislative uh, compromise, which prohibited new soda taxes through 2031, uh, that measure was withdrawn. But that doesn't mean that uh, soda industry or, or some other uh, group couldn't come along and propose a new measure. And one of the things to bear in mind in that regard is that uh, such a measure could impose a new vote threshold uh, retroactively. Uh, so the soda tax measure, for example, would have required that all uh, taxes passed after January 1, 2018, uh, cease to be collected unless they were subsequently approved by the voters. So uh, there is uh, uh, unfortunately no guarantee that even if you're successful in passing a measure before such a law were to take effect, uh, that it couldn't try to retro retroactively uh, sweep your efforts in uh, and impose a, a higher threshold uh, on, uh, on your effort. Uh, so that's a, a sort of a brief summary of the law, Margaret, and of course, is there any if questions? It, if, uh, if people want to use it? the raise hand function, um, I'm trying to monitor that, uh, or it, with some follow-up questions. Well, my major follow-up questions is you're looking at a group of people who are trying to figure out how they're going to get a ballot measure to pass for money. Uh, you're their lawyer. What are you going to say to them? <laughs> well, so, you know, it's, it's I, I've, as you know, Margaret, I've been asked this question probably two dozen times over the last, uh, over the last couple of years. And, you know, frankly, ultimately, it comes down to whether you're willing to take some risk. In, in my view, it's, it's, it's a good calculated risk to take because I think ultimately, though I can't guarantee it, I think ultimately the California Supreme Court, if it's ever uh, put in the position of having to decide this issue, will conclude that voter qualified special taxes only require a majority vote. So I think, I think from the standpoint of existing law, it's a pretty good bet 
that you'll be ultimately successful in enacting uh, you know, a, a special tax that you qualify by circulating a petition among the voters uh, with a majority vote. What I can't, uh, what I can't predict uh, is what anti-tax forces uh, might have up their sleeve. Uh, we, we, we know obviously that they've tried to impose higher thresholds in the past, so it would not come as a surprise to me at all uh, if they don't try again. Uh, and, and ultimately then the risk that you're taking is that that happens and that uh, you know, notwithstanding the fairly progressive uh, political climate here in California, uh, that they're able to convince a sufficient number of voters uh, to increase the threshold to, uh, to raise taxes. Um, Nicole, do you have anything you want to add to that from a political perspective? Are you there? Yep, I'm here. Um, yeah, I mean, just thank you so much, James. You know, I think this is really exciting and it's evolved so much over the last couple of years. You know, we thought this was a little glimmer of hope um, two years ago and it has become real. And so I guess my perspective is just really encouraging folks to, to move forward and use this as much as they can because we don't know if it's gonna be around forever. There is a risk, you know, I, I think is a relatively small risk around retroactively, you know, these things being void. That's a pretty hard, bar to, to make, you know, from a voter perspective and a legal perspective too. So um, it feels like really worth the risk. And I think if we look at the campaigns that have won and lost when it comes to these children's fund measures that we've done in California, the vast majority of those that have lost got over 50 plus one. There've been a couple that got less than 50%, um, you know, when the political establishment was totally against them and things like that. But most of them, you know, 66%, 65%, you know, we can go down the list from looking at Sacramento and Marin and um, San Joaquin and, you know, other places. So there's a lot of examples where we could get that 50 plus one, but we couldn't get two thirds. I do want to make sure folks understand, you know, from a campaign perspective, it costs money to gather signatures, right? Um, so when you're balancing it out, you know, when you can get the board of supervisors or a city council to put things on the ballot, it doesn't cost the campaigns any money. Um, but there's a lot of advantages to signatures as well. You know, you can really decide what the measure is going to be. You don't have to negotiate um, in the same way that you do if you're trying to get on the ballot through the legislature of, you know, whatever the other city council or board of supervisors. So it also gives you a lot more autonomy. Obviously, you still have to make the same political calculations around figuring out who's going to be for it and who's going to be against it. Um, but there's often more autonomy involved when you go the signature route. So um, I think it's really exciting. There's a lot of hope here. Um, don't be scared by the price tag of signatures because a, um, you know, if you get started early, there's ways of, you know, working and having volunteers do some, but, you know, be realistic. Volunteers are not going to collect all your signatures. In almost any case, you will have to pay for it. But what you spend on collecting the signatures is a lot less money than you need to spend in your campaign. Because if your polling says you're at 60, 65 percent, um, you spend the money to get the signatures you probably don't need to spend a ton of money on your campaign um, unless you have a real opposition, right? Whereas if you have to get two thirds, yeah, you're not spending the money on collecting signatures, but you're spending a ton of money in the campaign to get to that threshold of two thirds. So um, don't be scared by the price tag. So I can say more later, but those are my sort of initial thoughts. Okay, the people have their hands raised. Jesus, do you have your hands right, hand raised? Jesus, are you there? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you, Margaret. Um, thank you, James and Ben. This is super helpful. I had a, I hope it's a simple question, but probably, uh, probably not. Um, our young people in Pomona, as we were kind of educating them and ourselves on the possibilities and how to approach this, we're still in our exploratory phase of what we want to do. And they asked a brilliant question, why can't we do both in terms of a set aside and a new tax. So that's the question in terms of uh, developing an ordinance. Is it possible to do both with one ordinance? Um, yeah. So if, uh, Jesus, if I, if I understand your question correctly, uh, the, it, 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 as long as uh, everything that you intend to, to spend, all the, all the revenues that you hope to spend, 
would be generated by the tax that you impose, then that can be accomplished in a, in a single measure. The, the whole concept of a special tax is that you are imposing a tax and then you're marking the revenues for a specific purpose. So that's done, that's done all the time. Uh, when you use the word set aside, it, it, uh, it, gives, me some, <laughs> it gives me some pause uh, because at the, at the county level for uh, general law counties uh, that are subject to the County Budget Act, uh, set asides raise, uh, raise legal uh, concerns. Uh, but if what you're talking about is a special tax and then you earmark those revenues for a specific purpose, that's fine. But if you have the legal authority to do a set aside, he's from a city that is a charter city. Um, is there any reason why you couldn't do them all in one measure? Uh, good, good question, Margaret. So, uh, no, uh, uh, there, there isn't. Uh, one thing I would, uh, I would note, though, is that you need to be uh, careful. Many set asides would require a, a, an amendment of the city charter. Uh, because there are uh, are uh, powers uh, bestowed on the board, of, excuse me, on the on the city council, uh, as is the case in San Francisco, for example. Uh, so you just want to be be careful that you amend uh, the appropriate instruments if you're going to consider that. And I'm assuming, by the way, that the set aside would be for the same purpose as the as the tax that you impose. So uh, so you have a unified uh, purpose. And they can be in the same measure. Yes. You're sure. <laughs> Again, you know, with, with, the, with the caveat I mentioned about the county uh, and the different, you know, the fact that there are some charter provisions um, that should be feasible. It's the LA County, they can do this. Okay, so I had thought we would do all the questions about the, um, uh, the voter threshold first, but it doesn't actually matter. It's, they're, they're all related. So I, I have, um, a question from Courtney. Do you want to ask it yourself or should I read it? Courtney? Sure. I was just curious, um, you know, as these things get to the higher courts, who orchestrates that that process and that kind of chart of work? Is it the organizing bodies? Is it a local government champion? Um, and then what's the, the cost to all that? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And the answer is it has it has varied uh, significantly. So um, it, it, first of all, depends upon the posture of the case. So for example, in, uh, in the city of Fresno, Fresno refused to uh, certify the measure as having passed. So that meant that the pro proponents of the, uh, of the special tax uh, measure P had to uh, challenge the city's failure to certify, so so they controlled the, the litigation. Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association intervened uh, to defend the city's action. The city effectively remained uh, neutral. In other cases, as in uh, as was the case in San Francisco and in, in Oakland, uh, the Board of Supervisors and the City Council in San Francisco and Oakland, respectively, certified uh, the the measures as having been approved, even though they didn't get a two thirds vote. And what that meant is that the uh, opponents of the taxes filed the lawsuits and the city or in San Francisco's case, the city and county uh, defended the laws. Um, the, the same is true in Alameda with uh, Measure C where the county is currently defending the law. But even in those cases, uh, some of the interest groups have intervened as uh, what are called amicus. So they've filed uh, briefs with the court uh, arguing their own point of view on these issues. So that's one way in which the interest groups have been able to participate uh, without bearing all the costs of litigation, which can be quite significant. Um, I wanna, can I just jump in? I'm not a lawyer, I'm September. I was involved in the San Francisco story and baby Prop C, one of the leading ones, the commercial gross receipts tax for ECE on the city side when I was uh, involved both as a community member and voter and as a public servant. Um, there's something called, I think it was validation where the city right. made the city attorney, Dennis Rose, amazing as a San Franciscan, I will say that. There's a choice where you can say, come get me, like speak now and object 
or forever hold your peace sort of on the tax. I don't know what that's called legally, but you're it right. it's really it's, critical it's called calculus a, for us right. in San Francisco at that time, if you could just speak to yeah. that. So that's called a validation action. This is a provision uh, in the law that allows uh, government agencies essentially to, to clear all legal issues, usually associated with a bond or a tax, uh, so that all comers, as you said, have to lodge any objections within a very limited period of time uh, so that any uh, legal doubt about the validity of the action can be uh, quickly resolved. So in, in the case of the three San Francisco measures, uh, in, in two of the uh, cases, the city initiated validation actions. Uh, in another case, they were sued. Uh, so all three cases have, have proceeded along, but validation actions are, are a mechanism to try to get these kinds of questions resolved more quickly uh, than, the, than the normal path. I, I should make clear though that uh, more quickly doesn't mean quickly in, in any terms that most of us would, would think of. You know, these cases uh, can take years to, to get resolved even when, uh, even when they're expedited as is the case with validation actions. And what that means in, in San Francisco's case uh, and in the case of Alameda is that even though they began to collect the tax revenues, they were escrowed. Uh, so the, the, you know, the counties were not spending those dollars uh, because they were awaiting the outcome of the, of the litigation. Uh, in the city of Oakland, uh, they're not even collecting the tax yet. Uh, so that's another, you know, another thing to, to bear in mind is that uh, these kinds of legal challenges uh, can result in, in delays that affect, uh, you know, the ability to actually deploy the revenues that you generate. So uh, it requires a good dose of patience. But the presumption is, as we go down this journey, that there'll be less and less challenges as it gets more and more settled and as more of these cases win in court. But I wanted to ask you, for, for people who are on this call, it's like there's a difference between does your city or county agree with you that it only requires a, a, a majority vote? Or are they from the outset putting on in their ballot handbook, et cetera, that it requires a two thirds vote because what it, they will agree with you, right? If you get signatures, right? If you don't get, yeah, can you? Yeah, well, you're, you're, you're right, Margaret. And that can also affect, uh, can also affect the costs as well. But fortunately uh, now that we have uh, three appellate court decisions all of which have concluded that the special taxes, voter qualified special taxes only require a, a majority vote. Uh, those decisions are binding on uh, trial courts across the state. So I think we're past the point where a city attorney could, uh, could write a, uh, an impartial analysis uh, with a statement that the measure requires a two thirds vote. Uh, and if that were to happen, uh, uh, a, a, a very quick lawsuit should be filed uh, to, to correct that. Um, so the, you're right, Margaret, that the presumption now, in fact, the, you know, the state of the law binding on trial courts is that voter qualified special taxes only require a majority vote. Uh, so that means that you're going to be on the offensive uh, not the defenses, not the defensive, uh, as was the case with many of the efforts uh, in 2018, where, uh, where there was not yet a clear answer. So as a result, for example, in the city of Oakland, the city attorney, uh, you know, scored the measures requiring a two thirds vote, which was, you know, not an unreasonable position at the time because the law was unclear. But fortunately, now we do have some clarity on that point. Okay, so uh, Michelle has raised her hand. Do you still have a question? Michelle? Hi. Hey, it's Amisha. It's Lou. Hi, Margaret. Hi. It's Lou. Um, oh, hi, Lou. <laughs> you I'm introduced to yourself. Uh, Michelle, we have a we have a staff wellness event, so I did the first part, um, and then I let Michelle go participate. So I'm, I took over for her. I'm Lou Calanche. I'm the executive director of Legacy LA, and um, we just had a, a huge win. I'm sure Michelle shared. But so my question is around like the next step for us is how to get this department funded and adequately funded, right? 
Um, and I know Jesus brought up the, the set aside or the carve out. Um, so I, I guess my question, the legal question is like these cases that you described, would it cover like a set aside or carve out? And, and your response to, to Jesus, I wasn't quite sure. Yeah, so, so th th thanks, for, thanks for asking that question. Uh, I, I guess if, if, if you could just uh, clarify for me, so are you referring to uh, just a set aside, so not a special tax as well, but just, just, just so a set aside? Our, like kind of our initial conversation is about um, possibly like an initiative, a ballot initiative that requires the city to allocate, say like 2% of the general fund dollars to a youth department. Right. That's kind of the, the kind of the first kind of line of thinking. I don't know what the number is going to be, but that's kind of what, what we're thinking, which was done in the county through like Measure J. Right. And which is L.A. It's a charter city and they just did. Yeah. So there's yeah. A long and then the follow up to that. So you could think about this all together is are any. So are in, do any of these cases and the rulings on these cases, um, do those um, also cover like a set aside? And then also, sorry about that. And also um, in the cases that are still um, in the appellate system or in the appellate courts that are, we're waiting on rulings, um, do those um, have, are those answering the same question um, that the earlier um, cases that are favorable to like what we're trying to do? Are there the same question that's being um, asked and it's just in a different court? So those are like the two questions. Okay, let me let me take the uh, the last one first. Okay. So all of the cases that I, I mentioned um, share share one common question, which is which is whether uh, the vote uh, threshold is is two thirds or a, a majority. They're all they're all special taxes that were qualified for the ballot by the voters, so they all address that question. Uh, there are. Uh, Two, two of the cases that raise uh, additional questions beyond that, um, which is yet another reason that they could attract a, you know, attention from uh, the Supreme Court. So in the city of Oakland, one of the issues there is that the city attorney uh, in the voter pamphlet told the voters that it would require a two thirds vote. And then the city certified the measures having passed even though it got only 62.5% of the vote. So the uh, opponents are arguing that the city changed the rules uh, after the end of the, of the game. So that's a, a, a different issue. In the Alameda County Measure C case, there are also a couple of additional issues there. Uh, they argue that the measure addressed different subjects, that somehow pediatric health is different than uh, early care and, and education uh, is a separate subject. Uh, and they also argue that the measure violates a, another provision in the constitution because it identifies children's hospital as one of the organizations that might, uh, that might help with the effort. Uh, but otherwise they all raise the same question. But um, we're talking about a set aside, James, which has always required only a majority vote, period. No? Uh, uh, <laughs> with, uh, so Margaret, the reason I'm, I'm hesitating is no. because, so two things. One, none of these cases has addressed a set aside. Uh, they've all been special tax cases. Uh, San Francisco- I was uh, question, and that's what worried me. Yeah. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. The Children's Fund in San Francisco is yeah. a set aside. The one in Richmond is a set aside. Uh, they were going for one in Sacramento. Right. No, all, all these are, are set asides, and we put them on the ballot because they only required a majority. Correct. You're you're absolutely right, Margaret. The, the reason I'm hesitating is because uh, San Francisco's Prop S. Yeah. Uh, that was the measure that uh, uh, that that earmarked uh, some of the hotel tax revenues. Yeah, for, I worked on that. Yeah. For the arts. Yeah. That that was the Dennis Herrera score that is requiring a two thirds vote, and frankly, yep. I wasn't quite sure why, Nicole. So yeah, it was because it was it was a set aside of a specific tax, the hotel tax specifically. Okay. So if you do a set aside of the general fund, it's fifty plus one, but you okay. cannot do a set aside of a specific tax. Mm -hmm. um, this was saying that hotel revenue 
has to go towards arts. Um, anyway, then we went back to the ballot and won the next time around and got two thirds, but that's right. why that is. So it's an okay. important distinction. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. To parse this yeah. even more carefully, the San Francisco <laughs> Children's Fund, the grandmother of all this, is a set aside of the property tax. I but think the difference the with the arts tax was it had already been set aside for something different. I mean, it has already had been used or no. It will. So it, it, it was a general, it was a general, uh, well, no, some of the, some of the funds went into the general fund. Some of them were earmarked for specific programs. Right. So I think what Nicole's saying is, is correct. The city attorney basically treated that yeah. measure as, as creating a special tax. Uh, so that's why it was uh, scored as requiring a two thirds vote. So can I just ask then, just so that I'm clear, who provides the authority for the 50% plus one for the set aside? Is it the city charter? Is the state constitution? Where is it? Where can I go to say like, I can do this? Uh, so if there are any restrictions, they'd be in the city charter. Will you look at the city, city charter for her? But yep. They just did this with Measure J. They did yeah, it. no, I, 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 I think, I, I, I think, uh, I think we've cleared up the one lingering concern I had, which is why, which was that I didn't understand why Dennis Herrera had scored uh, Prop S as requiring two thirds. So Nicole's explanation makes sense, but we will look at the charter and make sure there is are no. The state, is it in the state constitution or is it just a common practice that you can put a ballot initiative that creates a set aside and then cities can create restrictions on whether you can? In yeah, so, so so where is the authority for me to do this? Sure. So the, the authority is in two places. One, the state constitution uh, provides the power of initiative to the voters in uh, cities and counties, but it allows the legislature to uh, establish rules for for those measures. And if you're a charter city, the charter can establish rules for uh, for measures within uh, the you know within the city. Perfect. Okay. So what you're basically doing, correct me if I'm wrong, you're basically amending the charter of your city. And that's what you'd be doing in Pomona. It's what you'd be doing in LA. It's what I think you're doing in Sacramento, what we did in San Francisco. You're amending the charter to put aside a certain amount of money in the general fund to children. I feel like this gets to the questions that Sacramento had. Do, oh, do you want to ask and ask again? No, no, I just wanted to thank him for answering. Oh. Thank you guys. For James, answering. I just want to jump in real quick because the Constitution does say that the charter amendments can be made by a simple majority vote. And there have been cases on that. None of them have been about set, set asides, but they have talked about that you can't put a, a higher requirement in the charter. I didn't know that. So uh, are our Sacramento people, Jim Ketty, are you there? Because this these questions lead to your questions about cannabis and set asides of cannabis dollars. Yeah, thanks, Margaret. Um, you know, we're kind of grappling with the next round here. And one of our questions has been about raising the cannabis tax. Um, our city has an existing tax in place on cannabis businesses. The dollars flow to the general fund. We've talked about um, having those dollars, some part of those dollars or all of those dollars set aside for youth. We've talked about raising the cannabis tax and having the amount that we collect as a result of the increase go to youth. Um, we've talked about um, uh, sort of doing a cannabis tax increase and then doing a separate measure that does a set aside, trying to avoid a two thirds vote. Um, uh, so we're kind of just grappling with a lot of different options, James, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on, on any of those. Yeah. Sure. So uh, first, with respect to a measure that would just, you know, increase the cannabis tax, uh, assuming that's voter qualified under current law, majority vote. Uh, if you were to uh, to combine uh, a uh, an increase in the tax and a, a set aside, uh, that too should uh, should require only a majority of vote and assuming that all of the uh, revenues are uh, being directed for the same purposes, funding early care and education programs that uh, that shouldn't raise any issues. You would want to take a look at the 
city charter and, and, and identify whether that needs to be accomplished by charter amendment or whether you could just amend the municipal code. Um, James, so that scenario would be with signature gathering. Is that what you're saying? Correct, yeah. correct. So if, if, the, you know, if the city council places uh, such a measure on the ballot, uh, it, it's going to, well, if the city council puts a tax increase on the ballot, it's going to uh, require a two thirds vote. Yeah. So to the point Nicole raised earlier, you know, che cheaper to cheaper to have the legislative body place the measure on the ballot because you avoid the cost of uh, gathering signatures, but it also means you're subject to a higher vote threshold. Yeah, and um, James, if uh, the city council puts a measure on the ballot to raise the tax, but the money's still going to the general fund. And then we have a separate measure that's a budget set aside, not related to cannabis. Both of those would be simple majority votes. Is that correct? That's correct. In fact, that's similar what, to what the city of Richmond did. Uh, it, did a, uh, it did a set aside for children's services and then uh, made the, the funding contingent upon new general fund revenues coming in. And then they put an increase in the documentary transfer tax on the ballot, uh, both passed with simple majority uh, and the passage of the increase in the documentary transfer tax uh, essentially triggered the flow of money from the general fund uh, that had been set aside in the other measure. So there was a link, to the, the set aside was linked to the need for the tax measure to have been passed. Yeah, I, I think that was a function of the of the politics. It was not a it was not a legal requirement. Uh, okay. okay. But it Thank isn't. A, oh, go on, James. Do you have other uh, questions? Yeah, I was just going to say in Sacramento, just uh, other people may be in a similar situation. When our when our city passed its marijuana tax years ago, it actually gave the city council the option to raise the tax without going back to a vote of the people. So the ballot measure had this range of like four to 10%. So the reality is our city council would just raise the cannabis tax tomorrow on its own. And we could pursue some sort of a set aside um, through the ballot. Um, uh, so that a lot of local cannabis taxes have been written that way. Um, and if uh, that's something you'd be interested in looking at, I'm, I'd be happy to do a little research for you on it. This is a really important strategy. <laughs> you know, I think that we ought to think about this because a lot of people on our last call were thinking about cannabis taxes and this sort of the city or county has a cannabis tax. You put a measure on the board on the ballot for a port you know, for a set aside of a portion of that. You can do that, right, James? Uh so Margaret, Prop 64 uh, is fairly complex. So I would want, particularly when you're talking about a county uh, where cities have imposed their own cannabis tax, I think the county would be limited to imposing the tax in unincorporated areas. Uh, so that's just, that's a, a, a somewhat complex area. Uh, so I'd want to look at that a little bit more closely. Ben, do you have thoughts there? Yeah, we just did one in Ventura and we did it, well, I think you, James is right. You can only, if you're doing county, you can only do it in the unincorporated areas, and the cities will have their own cannabis taxes. The cannabis regulations are go, go from the cities, counties, and the states, so they're pretty complicated. But there, we have seen a lot of cannabis tax ordinances in a lot of counties and cities. Yeah, Prop 64 was silent on the question of local governments taxing cannabis. And my question was about a, a city that has already taxed cannabis, putting a measure on the ballot to set aside a portion of that tax for a specific purpose, doing it through signatures. And yeah, I think I, I think uh, so, so. That would be treated because you're you're you'd effectively be you're marking those funds for a specific purpose. It would be treated like a like it was a special tax, but under these cases, it should only be subject to a majority vote. But it is an example of a set aside of a specific revenue stream. Correct. And so can you talk for a minute about our poor general law counties? Because we have 
San Joaquin on. They have so much less flexibility. Can you come up with some good idea about how they can get a measure passed? Well, I mean, honestly, for the general law counties, the set aside is just not an option. Um, so I think for, for general law counties, you need to look at, uh, at imposing a special tax uh, and earmarking those revenues for the, the specified purpose. Um, I think that's your, your, your path. But could you collect signatures there and only need a majority vote? Yes. So if San Joaquin County wanted to put a cannabis tax on the ballot that went to kids, they could do that, they'd get the signatures and then it would only need a 50% vote? Correct, again, with a caveat that uh, I believe the tax uh, would only apply in the unincorporated portions of the county uh, because the cities would have jurisdiction to impose their own cannabis taxes. I don't know if Kay is still on, but do you have any questions to follow up on that? I, I don't think so. I think that just really affirms what- What you knew. Uh-huh, and just that now that precedent has been set, probably our county council isn't gonna be able to write a different sort of um, brief, which changes things significantly for us. Okay, am, am I right in remembering that in, in your case, county council concluded that it required a two thirds vote? Correct. Yeah, so, so I really think uh, that would not be possible given current law. So you do have some leverage there now that you didn't have before. But they'd still have to get signatures. Correct. Okay. okay. Um, any um, other? Hey, Margaret. Oh, sorry. There's a there's a bunch of questions in the chat about signature cost. Do you want me to go through that now or wait? I was going to wait a minute on that. Okay, great. No we, problem. If we had since, and I thought we should do a whole session on signatures. To be honest, how to collect them, what it costs, what goes into it. I mean, you could say a few words at the end of this, but. Um, I, I think we ought to do a whole session on that. There is a category of money that I'm interested in, although, uh, which is how people who want to move money from law enforcement into child and youth development. If you have any brilliant or less than brilliant <laughs> um, ideas about how to go about doing that. James? Uh, and, well, Again, in, in, uh, in counties, that, that is more problematic. Um, in cities, you probably have a little bit more leeway, especially in charter cities. But you know, that's gonna require an analysis of, of the various sources of funds and, uh, uh, and would make drafting, I think, more complex uh, than imposing a tax and earmarking the revenues for you know, for your purpose. But you could do it. Uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, well, so, so the only, well, so Margaret, there is one, one additional wrinkle there, uh, which is that there is a, a rarely used uh, doctrine called the essential government functions doctrine, uh, which has been employed by the courts to strike down a couple of, of, of ballot measures and it essentially provides that the voters don't have the power to interfere uh, with a, you know, city or county's essential government functions um, by you know, uh, hamstringing or, or tying the hands of their uh, elected officials. And I can imagine when it comes to, uh, to police uh, that, uh, that that argument could be raised. So I think that's one where you just need to do a, a bunch of research before going down that path. Okay, and then a question that comes up to me and that some people have asked is, if people wanna create a department for children, youth, their families and do a dedicated revenue measure, can they be in the same measure? That's kind of like Hazel's yes. question. Yeah, yeah. about Pomona. Yeah. Because the limitations and being in the same measure would be are by subject or. Well, so there, uh, um, 
uh, yeah, so the, there's something called the single subject rule, uh, which actually does not apply when legislative, when, when a city council places a measure on the ballot, then you may have to help me here. I'm not sure whether that case has been extended to a voter qualified measure, but uh, assuming it hasn't, all it means is that all parts of your measure have to be reasonably germane to one another. So if you're creating a department for, for children and you're providing funding to it, then not only are those two parts reasonably germane to one another, they're functionally related. So you would you know, easily survive a, uh, a single subject challenge. Marcos, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Oh, well, I was just curious, just though I was trying to, I feel like <laughs> I'm a law school dropout. So I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting these rules down. <laughs> So no, I, I was curious, you know. So so Measure A was a little less than two years ago uh, in in Fresno City, not County, it's the city. Um, and so I, if I was under, I, I wanted to double check. So theoretically speaking, we can if, if we had a a voter initiated uh, you know ballot um, uh, initiative. I mean, uh, we can get a set aside to to look at those funds because ninety percent of those funds were supposed to go to like public safety and everything, and then the the other ten percent were going to be kind of to this commission that was going going to look at race equity issues and whatnot. So I'm thinking, so we would, we could just run that and and then get that set aside to maybe look at that ninety percent. And and I'm not asking politically as far as like I could think of who would would would, would attack that, but I'm thinking, <laughs> so that's tech, theoretically possible. Yeah, theoretically possible, though, I have to say, I think we need to better understand. I'm not familiar with Measure A, so we need to better understand what uh, what Measure A involved, um, whether it was new revenues or whether it was setting aside general fund it, revenues. It, yeah, it was it was. Uh, well, as far as I remember it or understand it, it was it was uh, a tax on the uh, business license for, for uh, marijuana. I see. Yeah. So, yeah, then, then it. Again, subject to actually looking at it it, 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 it seems like conceptually, at least, it would be possible to redesignate funds, just as San Francisco's Prop S did with hotel tax revenues for a different purpose. Because this happens a lot to people where, you know, everybody thinks, oh, this tax and everybody, you know, has a picture of a kid on the campaign thing and then none of the money goes to kids. So the solution is go back to the ballot and demand the, and demand a portion of that tax actually go to kids, right? That's what people ought to really think about that for all the times we've been screwed over by not getting our share of the tax. Okay, I noticed that Jim Ketty has put the post-election analysis from Sacramento, the link. I have to highly recommend it. It is a fabulous analysis of what happened in Sacramento and, you know, how issues about race and uh, it, it, it sort of so a, a kind of overwhelmed the <laughs> the campaign. And anyway, it, it it's very informative, and people would enjoy reading it. Well, enjoy isn't the right word, but um, so call out if you have a question. I'm I'm trying to look at hands raised. I'm trying to look at the sig at the at the. Uh, you know, the chat, maybe now would be a time, Nicole, to talk about the signatures. Good thing. Um, okay, so here's how you sort of figure it out. And, and I agree, we'll do a whole session on this. But the first thing is, how many signatures do you need? So signatures are based upon how many votes came in in the last gubernatorial election and needing 10% of the, everyone that voted, not the same people, but 10% of the total voters that voted in the last gubernatorial election have to sign your signatures in order to get on the ballot, okay? So it used to be, so back in 2014, the turnout was really low for the governor's race. We didn't really have a contested governor's race. There wasn't much on the ballot. So that threshold up until after 2018 was a lot lower. Um, good problem to have because it means a lot of people voted in 2018. You know, they voted in the midterm elections, um, big con contested congressional elections. There was a contested governor's race, but that threshold's gone up quite a bit. So if you haven't looked at how much you need in a while, you definitely want to look because it's based on the 2018 numbers. So um, to give you an example of that, so um, 
In San Francisco, for instance, um, that means that a proponent has to gather 51,325 valid signatures to qualify. That's for a charter amendment in San Francisco. Um, and then an ordinance in San Francisco, you only need 5% of registered voters. Um, and that's based on the mayor's or the last mayor's race. So it gets kind of complicated depending on what you're going to need to do. Are you do, trying to do a charter amendment? Are you trying to do an ordinance? Some cities are charter cities, you know, some are not. So um, you may only need to get 5% of the people that voted in the last mayoral election, the municipal le level, that's obviously gonna be a lot less than that threshold of the governor's race. So first thing is figuring out what are you trying to do? Second thing is how many signatures do you need in order to qualify? And that really does vary, but depending on the city or the county and, and looking into that. So then you have to figure out, okay, how much does every signature cost? Um, there is a huge variance on that, right? Um, the sort of cheapest it's probably going to be is $5 a signature. Um, it's pretty rare that you can get lower than that on a county or a local level. Sometimes statewide, they can get a little bit lower than that because they're able to just do it at scale um, and have a whole lot of people, you know, come in working at scale. But $5 is probably as low as you're going to get. And a lot of times, you know, we've seen it go up to 10, even $15 a signature um, because it depends, you know, are you trying to, do you want to invest in your local community, <clears throat> use it as a chance to be able to build power, you know, amongst um, folks that are within your community that are active, that care about the issues. Um, and if so, you know, maybe you could have a mix of volunteer and paid activities, but it's, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to happen for nothing. You're going to have to have some paid signature gatherers. These firms, you know, there's not that many of them that do it and they make, you know, quite a bit of money doing it, but they also, you know, take it really seriously and do a good job and they do the quality control. You only pay for the valid signatures that you get. So if you're required to get 9,000 valid signatures, most of the time you wanna collect at least a third more than that. And oftentimes even up to 50% more than that to ensure that they're valid because people have moved, you know, people might not realize if they're registered or not, um, et cetera. So that's just a couple of things to think about. And, you know, we can work with you as you get closer and kind of dig into the numbers, but. Hopefully it's helpful. I, I just have one question, and maybe it's a James question. Maybe it's a, it, it seems like the whether you need ten percent or fifteen percent or five per, or five percent depends in part. Um, for instance, our Richmond friends thought they only needed ten percent, and then at the end they were told, you know, like five minutes before the signatures were due, that they actually needed fifteen because it was a revenue measure, not a. Uh, not another kind of measure. So I don't know how, uh, how much you know about that, James, or? I don't know what, what happened in Richmond, but so charter, uh, charter cities can specify in their charter, uh, the you know, thresholds. Uh, so if you're in a charter city, you definitely want to check that. Uh, otherwise, as Nicole said, the thresholds are established in the elections code for, for counties and cities uh, uh, separately. Okay, but so people should look to, I, I, I would say go to your register of voters, but they are often not well informed. Uh, generally speaking, I think it would be 10% of the people who voted in the last governor's election. Um, I'm wondering if I'm missing anybody who has questions they would like to call out or if I could coax James into uh, any other, <laughs> we, 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 we stay up at night trying to think of things to tax, trying to think of clever ways to collect money. Mm -hmm. I mean, are you aware of any new things that people are taxing? Any, and do you have any ideas about things we could think about taxing, especially that are related to the needs of children and youth? Um, I, you know, for instance, I think, you know, like video games and, and um, are there things happening around the state that can give us any new ideas about this? And it looks like you unmuted yourself. Did you have an idea? Well, I'd say one big, not a big one, but one that's been happening a lot are gross receipts taxes, and you can kind of tier them by different industries. And that's what San Francisco did. And they had uh, you know, it's similar to a sales tax or an income tax for these for businesses in the jurisdiction. 
And there are a lot of restraints on how counties and cities can tax in the in state law. So you can't do that income tax like you pay to the state or federal government. So you do have to be creative, but there that's a big one that we've seen. I know San Francisco had a couple other really creative ones. They did like a CEO tax. I'm not, Jameson probably knows more about it. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the CEO tax was actually, uh, it was a just an increase in the gross receipts tax on companies that paid their CEOs uh, a certain uh, dollar threshold. And I, I don't know whether, so Ben is, ben is right that, uh, uh, state tax law is, is fairly complex and the uh, uh, taxing authority of uh, general law cities and, and counties is you know, derived from the legislature. Uh, so there are limits on what can be taxed. And, and I don't know, for example, whether San Francisco was able to do the gross receipts tax because it's a charter uh, county and city, which I assume is probably the case because it's the only uh, charter city county in the state uh, that imposes a, uh, a payroll tax. So, uh, Margaret, the, the sort of short answer is that um, there are a, a limited array of, of options and there are restraints that you need to be aware of. You know, for example, uh, sales tax uh, limits apply uh, and without special legislation, uh, there are you know, some counties uh, and cities that are already uh, maxed out. Uh, so you'll just wanna carefully explore uh, what, your, what your options are depending upon your, your jurisdiction, uh, you know, charter city, uh, general law city, charter county, uh, general law county, and where. <clears throat> Yeah, so I'm thinking about closing. I mean, so, <laughs> winding this up. So, does anybody have any? You want to unmute yourself? Oh, yeah, Erin. I, I have a question. Yeah. Actually, it just came up, and I was just thinking about it. Are there certain taxes? So, you know, we've talked about cannabis and soda. Some of you know, we've heard feedback that that oftentimes those taxes are disproportionately impacting the families we're actually seeking and working with, um, uh, and seeking to help. And so. Are there certain taxes that are tend to be, you know, more for like the more affluent kind of end of the income spectrum? Um, just out of curiosity. Yeah, I mean that is that is part of the challenge because obviously sales taxes are are, are regressive. Uh, income taxes can be more progressive, but uh, local you know municipalities don't have uh, the authority to impose income taxes. Um, so th that's a challenge, you know, documentary transfer taxes, which are taxes on the sale of, uh, of real property. Some jurisdictions have, uh, like Santa Monica and Culver City have tiered them so that, uh, there's a higher rate, uh, you know, for a more expensive home that's sold. Um, part of the problem there is that, uh, documentary transfer taxes can only be uh, general fund taxes. You can't you can't do a special tax with a documentary transfer tax. Um, but that's where your second measure can come in. Correct. So yeah, as, a, as Richmond did. Yeah. Right. So you would do a measure that would. Yeah, that's that's a good put point, a, Margaret. Put a set aside based yeah. on getting new revenue and then you do the documentary transfer tax, which can be a progressive tax. Correct. I mean, you can only you'll say it's tax on properties that were worth over a million dollars or right. you know, whatever and that would work in a community where you like like san diego where you had you know a, a lot of expensive real estate next to a yeah. lot of um other kinds of real estate and that's something maybe we should consider particularly for a place like san diego where yeah i think th i think that would work with the with the richmond with the richmond approach where there was a, a you know, a, a set aside from the general fund uh, triggered by an increase in, in the general fund revenues. And then you pair that with a, with a documentary transfer tax increase. And you could, you could even exempt, uh, you know, exempt from the increased homes that are sold under a certain level uh, so that uh, low income uh, and even middle income people would not be hit with it and then make it marginal so that, you know, with each additional, you know, tier of revenue, 
a higher tax is paid. That could make it progressive. Can you do property transfer taxes at the county level, or is it only a city kind of tax? Uh, so Stockton. there are in Stockton. I mean, I'm thinking Sam Lucky, because it, yeah. it is a progressive. It can be made into a progressive tax, which everybody is looking for. Right. I and think especially I... in a place where you're selling a lot of property, or in the you know you have all this very high value property. Uh, again, there may be uh, general versus charter uh, issues there, Margaret. Documentary transfer taxes are authorized at the county level by state law. Uh, and I don't know whether there is any exclusive uh, delegation there where, for example, the legislature has provided that only the Board of Supervisors uh, can exercise that authority. So that's that's a question that would require more research. Can, can if you're we, in a charter city, you certainly can. But beyond that, it's right. it's not and clear. San Diego is a charter city. Yep. But but is so here here's the deal. Um, we have a contract with James <laughs> to do a certain number of hours of work for funding the next generation. So we have some questions we can ask him when we still <laughs> until the contract runs out. And he can be available to help any of you draft something for a, you know, or, or begin to draft something or, and to ask some of the basic kinds of questions that you have. I would ask that you funnel them through me. <laughs> um, but as you get a more specific legal question, we can pose that to James. And, uh, and as you have a specific draw, a drafting need, and I will now ask the question about the real estate transfer tax um, to, add to, your, to put on your list. Um, and so, and does anybody else have any questions, any concerns, any, does anybody have any closing comments? I'd like to hear if this was useful to people, maybe some comments about how this went and ideas about what we do next. This, this was so great. I'm definitely going to have to listen to the recording at least two more times <laughs> <laughs> and review my notes, but my brain is on fire and I loved it. Thank you so much. Um, but in the next generation and, and James, great to, to meet you and looking forward to working with you. <laughs> Any other thoughts, comments? I have to say, when I met James, I felt like I had finally met the lawyer that I had always wanted to meet, who knew everything there was to know, almost, about this, till he discovered that real estate transfer taxes couldn't be special taxes. And I thought, if he didn't know that, then it was not known, but whose answer is always, okay, let's figure out how to make it work rather than no, because lawyers always say no, you know, and he did say no a couple times here, but <laughs> we are extremely grateful to you. I am so glad you exist. And I'm so glad that you have done so much to help children's funds around the state and particularly in the Bay Area. So he has a special expertise in all the language and jargon that we use to, <laughs> to talk about kids and translating it into legal stuff. Um, so I will, I am thinking now, I don't know, I, I think I will poll people on I you know, I ask people when I ask you a question by email, it's fine with me just send back the answer and say, yes, no, never want to see you guys again, 